When 15-year-old Riley Crossman went missing from her home, it was soon apparent that foul play was involved, and though her family hoped and prayed that she would make it home unharmed, their worst fears were realised when her extremely decomposed body was discovered one week after her disappearance. Unfortunately for Riley, a killer was known to her, and in fact, lived under her own roof. Sickeningly, her murderer was actually someone who was supposed to provide her with love and protection. This is the tragic murder of Riley Crossman. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel, hope you're all okay. Today's case is testament to how, when we have the idea that the worst human beings lurk in the shadows, the reality is very often they're in sharp focus in our day-to-day -day lives. Riley Crossman was an absolutely gorgeous young girl, adored by everyone with our whole life in front of her. But she was struck down in her prime essentially because of the selfish desires of someone that should have wished to protect her. Let's look at who she was. She was born on the 22nd of December, 2003. She was born in West Virginia to her dad, Lance, and her mum, Chantelle. She had a younger sister, Jade, and she also had two brothers, Ryder and Riker. Apparently she adored them. She was genuinely a lovely big sister and she apparently loved children. She loved being in that position of having those siblings and being a mentor to some degree of those siblings. Now, her parents were divorced. So her mother lived in Berkeley Springs and she lived with her partner, Andy. And her father lived in Martinsburg and he lived with his girlfriend, Jessica. So she obviously had some unrest growing up because it's difficult going through the divorce of your parents, but to all intents and purposes, it appears that they're all settled. She did spend time at both of the houses, so clearly had an active relationship with dad and mum, but she was at her mum's place for the majority of the time. So her time was spent mostly at that property. And because of that, she attended Berkeley Springs High School. Apparently she was just a model student. She really was. Everybody who knew her, absolutely loved her and when I did some searches to look on social media because I always do that to kind of connect with people who essentially may have had a relationship with her to see the way that they're responding and reacting during a period when somebody goes missing all you saw was students just pleading for any information because she was such a loved peer and she was a member of the gymnastics team Riley was described by people who knew her as being a really innocent soul so she's somebody who I suppose had a level of naivety. We understand that because of her age, but essentially somebody that just had that real pure soul. She's very responsible. People said that she was incredibly kind. She was incredibly reliable. She was a very talented singer. She was a very talented dancer. She was a great artist. And her family said that she was really helpful, really caring, really intelligent, stubborn, and as dramatic as teenage girls come. And I think that's so beautiful. I think it's just such a well-rounded description, isn't it? That she's all those beautiful things, but also stubborn and as dramatic as teenage girls come. So her life is going really well. Essentially, everything, when you think about the pen portrait of possibility, is playing out as it should. She's somebody who's a great all-rounder. She's clever. She's ambitious. She's studious and she's well liked. And when anybody loses their life, their temperament and character shouldn't be brought into focus. Of course, no one deserves to be killed. But sometimes when you think about certain victims and the impact that they were gonna have on this world and the world around them, you can't help but feel that stab when you consider what this world has lost. And Riley was somebody who was going to be great. And because of the selfish actions of one person, that won't happen, that won't come to fruition now. In August of 2018, Riley starts having a really exciting time. She starts a relationship with a boy from her school who was called Hayden Lacey, and they're really good together. Riley's dad said that Hayden seemed to be a really good influence on her. 
the couple were very, very close. They were calling each other constantly. They were texting each other frequently when they weren't together. And they even FaceTimed regularly. So if it was at night and they couldn't obviously be together because they were at separate properties, they would just be online chatting to each other as they fell to sleep. And even if they were busy doing things, they would keep the call connected on FaceTime to just go about the business whilst that person was also connected going about theirs. So even though there's an innocence about this relationship, because clearly they're young, there's also this real maturity and wanting to be present with that person as often as possible. And a lot of times when you look back at your teenage years and you think about your relationships, they probably weren't the best because you're not really figuring out at that point something that's long term on the whole. But it does feel like Riley and Hayden had this depth to their connection. They also had matching Instagram accounts with hers being at that random girl says hello and his being that random guy says hi. So it's going really well for Riley, both on a relational experience, an educational experience and a social experience. On May the 7th, 2019, Riley gets home from school and at this point she notices that her mum's having a nap on the couch. Apparently she hadn't been feeling very well and she was working really hard, Riley's mother. So she did two different jobs. So she was literally trying to catch up on some sleep between shifts. She was obviously somebody who was very committed to bringing in an income. So at this point, Riley woke her mum up in time for her to go to work. And then she spent some time with her grandmother before she finally went to her room. So this is just an absolutely box standard day. When Chantel woke up, she went and checked on Riley in her room, but she wasn't there. And she recalled that she hadn't actually seen her the night before. So she'd come in from work about 10 p.m. And the reason that she hadn't actually seen her was because when she went to check on her in a bedroom, she noticed the door was closed and she thought, well, I'm not going to disturb her. I'm just going to leave her, assuming that she'd gone to bed and was most likely asleep. She had noticed that all the downstairs lights were still on and her partner, Andy, had also been asleep. So putting that all together, Chantel decided that maybe Riley had left early for school. So she knew that Hayden, her boyfriend, had a school trip to Washington DC that day. So she put it in her mind together that maybe she'd wanted to arrive early, spend a bit of time with him because they were kind of a bit obsessed with each other and that this would give them that window of opportunity before he left for that school trip. But later that day, Chantelle received a call from her mum, which is Riley's grandmother, who was really concerned because it had reached 3.30 p.m. and Riley hadn't yet got back from school. And this was really out of character. Riley was very responsible. She stuck to habits. And so instantly, Grandma is concerned that something's happened. Chantelle does the obvious, tries calling her on her mobile, but her texts aren't delivering and it's going straight to voicemail when she calls. So now she's starting to get that dread in the pit of her stomach because again, why isn't she able to contact her daughter? So she then rings her daughter's school because she wants to clarify whether she's still there. And to her horror, she finds out that Riley hadn't actually attended that day. You can imagine at that point, the panic that is going to set in. The idea that you have thought that firstly your daughter had been asleep the night before, but now you don't know because you didn't check on her physically. You just assumed she had gone to bed and then you've woken up the next morning and again, you've assumed that she's just left early for school. And then suddenly you're realizing that you haven't actually physically seen your daughter since you left for work the day before and no one knows where she is and she hasn't been to school. So as Chantelle's panic begins to rise, she ends up driving to the school because in her mind she thinks I'm going to meet Hayden, he's going to be coming back from his school trip and if I haven't heard from her and Grandma hasn't heard from her, the likelihood is that she will have been in contact with Hayden. If there is something that I'm not aware of, he will know. And so she turns up, obviously with the intention of having her fears soothed when he tells her, oh yeah, I've heard from her and everything's fine. But Chantelle's concern only intensifies after talking to Hayden because he hasn't heard from his girlfriend all day. So this is totally out of character. And now they are deeply worried. She rings the police straight away, reports Riley as missing, and they take it seriously. Because we all know that sometimes the police are a little bit lackluster 
when people don't return home, they often wait a while because they assume that the kid's going to turn up, but not in this case. They understood this isn't the kind of thing that Riley would do. They start looking for her. They start speaking to friends and family because they know it's really unlikely that she's run away from home. She couldn't drive as she was only 15 years of age, so she hadn't left using a car. She was really happy at school. She was in a really, really good place in the relationship. And even though her phone was missing, her phone charger, her purse and her glasses had been left in her room. Now, they are items she would have taken. If she was going to leave for any period of time, they would have gone with her. So it's a massive cause for concern. And when you consider young people these days, chargers are paramount in their world, aren't they? Glasses, if you need them to read, etc., they are paramount in their world. But to have left those items, it suggests that potentially she hasn't left the home of her own free will at all. So the police at this point start to suspect that Riley has been taken from her house rather than going of her own volition. So the family are beside themselves. You can't even begin to compute the psychologically devastating impact of thinking that somebody has taken your child against their will because you know somebody who does that is going to be sinister in their intent. You don't take somebody from their home against their will because you're taking them on a picnic. So everybody is frantic. Now, after speaking to Riley's friends and Hayden, it was found that she had actually been on a video call to Hayden until about 10 p.m. the night before. He'd fallen asleep, so they'd been doing that classic FaceTime call and then he indeed had nodded off. And he'd actually gone to sleep earlier than usual, of course, because he was going on the trip the next day. He had the DC trip ahead of him and just wanted to get some shut-eye. They'd apparently had a bit of an altercation on the call and it was because Riley was just worried that Hayden might talk to other girls on the field trip and we see this play out in young people's relationships all the time. It is quite scary when you're totally falling for someone and you imagine that they're going to be around girls and you're not going to be there to make sure that they're policed around those relationships and so they'd had a little bit of a conflict about it. She ended up texting a friend this was until about half past midnight and she didn't actually get a response from Riley to the last message that had been sent. So we know that she was texting, but then this final message that her friend sent never got a response. Then when Hayden had woken up in the morning, he did see that he'd actually missed a call from Riley at 5.40 a.m. And he started to get more and more concerned when he hadn't heard from her in the day. Bear in mind, she was really worried about him going on this trip and being around girls, so clearly she'd give him a call, wouldn't she? She'd be interrupting his day so that she could check that he was not doing anything untoward, and she hadn't. So for him, that was weird, and it didn't make sense. Now, Chantelle doesn't just live on her own. She's in a relationship, as I've said, with Andy, and so clearly they're going to speak to him. So initially... Andy's interviewed and he says that he doesn't really know what's happened to Riley and goes through his timeline of the day. So he said on the day that Riley disappeared, he'd slept for the night, then he'd left home at 5am for work and then he hadn't left the construction site all day. So he's suggesting he's got this very tight alibi. But they do some digging. And first of all, they find out that texts on his phone reveal that he had texted his friend Don at 2.30 a.m. Apparently, he tried to contact him over 12 times in the space of half an hour. So whatever was going on there, it seemed to be pretty important. Also, clearly hadn't slept, as he's suggesting to the police, because he's up at 2.30 a.m. religiously contacting his friend. He said that the reason he did that was because he'd wanted to hide at his friend's house because he had drugs and didn't want to be caught. Bizarre. I mean, genuinely, bizarre. Why would you want to hide at your friend's house because you've got drugs and don't want to be caught? How does that make any sense? Why would you get caught if you were at home? It just doesn't add up, and they know that right from the get-go. They feel like he's just making things up. Then when he's asked about what he did during the day, of course, he says, well, I didn't do anything with work. He said, I stayed all day at the work site. But the police knew 
this was a lie. He had left the job. He had gone home and he'd gone home for about four hours. So at this point, they questioned him clearly because why is he telling them lies, particularly when his stepdaughter essentially is missing? So one detective actually said to him, look, I know you're not being honest. I know you're not being honest because we know that your timeline and events isn't adding up. So Andy said, okay, I am lying. But the reason I've been lying is because I was going to buy drugs from my cousin at Sunoco. We all, from time to time, will tell lies. It's just part of human habit. In fact, the belief is that we tell a minimum of eight lies a day. And usually they're quite pro-social, aren't they? Usually they're quite pro-social. Sorry, Susan, you've had your hair done. Yes, it looks lovely. It looks lovely. I didn't know that very tight spiral perms were back, but you are rocking it. Maybe I'll have it done. You know, we do things like that. It's as simple as that because we want to make sure that we're not offending people. And sometimes we lie about things because we want to connect. So we'll overplay something that we've done because another person is doing it. And again, that's about connection. So lying is a part of the human makeup. But the lie that Andy is involving himself in has got nothing to do with what I've just been talking about because it makes sense why people tell the lies that I've just been suggesting. When it comes down to Andy, he's trying to state claim to a truth he's invented, which is, I needed to go and get drugs. And he's saying it to the police because he's saying, I know that's illegal. That's why I basically concocted a story that said that I was at work all day. I didn't want you to know that I was actually using drugs. So he's trying to suggest by taking responsibility and accountability for this, that it means that he's not had anything to do with Riley's disappearance and it was merely that he didn't want to get into certain trouble because he's admitting drug use. But the police, again, aren't buying it. And we see people who are liars do this a great deal because they think by seeming to be honest about something that is illegal, that will make the police go, oh, well, this guy is actually coming clean. But really, he's deflecting from the true guilt that he's feeling about another action and feeling that if he concocts this story, it will be believable because why would anybody admit to a police officer that they have been taking drugs? And the police get this all the time, but obviously Andy thinks that this is a really effective measure to deflect any concerns that they might have about him by appearing to just be an honest drug user, shall we say. Now the colleagues of Andy tell a different story. So first of all, they say to the police that Andy already had cocaine on him at the time he was leaving work. So he wouldn't have actually had to travel to get some more at all. And the officers actually say to Andy, look, we know that you're not telling the truth. We know you weren't at the Sunoco and we know that you did not buy drugs that day. So then it's like, oh, right, okay, mm, you know that about me and you know the other things about me because people are telling you that I actually wasn't at work and then I wasn't buying drugs, so I already had drugs. Oh, hang on a minute. Now I remember. Actually, I had gone back home because my drugs were at the house. So none of it is adding up and he just keeps changing his story. And hey, I get it. We all remember things over time differently to how we remember it at the initial origin, but not to the point where we literally forget all the important elements and then introduce completely different elements to the story. And that's what Andy is doing. So he is seeming incredibly suspicious. He's changed his story loads of times. That's not what an innocent person tends to do. I appreciate some people remember elements they didn't remember at the time of questioning, but not, oh, I was at work all day to, yeah, I actually went and scored drugs somewhere to, oh no, I didn't score drugs, I had drugs to, I just went home to get my drugs. Immediately, they are aware that this man is fabricating. And the big question is, why? Why are you fabricating? What do you know that you don't want us to know? And Chantel, who's obviously sitting there dealing with her daughter just disappearing, she said that Andy was acting really strangely. So when she said Riley's missing, Apparently he was really jittery, he was really nervous. And don't get me wrong, of course, you are gonna be highly anxious if somebody that you love or you have a relationship with is missing. But that's not what her intuition was telling her. There was something odd about his behavior. It wasn't contextual, it was about him 
not about Riley. It wasn't an extension of his anxiety over her being missing. It felt more internalized, more introspective about him dealing with something that was challenging. And the likelihood is that at the point that he knows Riley has been seen to be missing, he knows what's gonna come next. Because when a child is missing, there's gonna be an investigation. And this will be the moment where things get very real for Andy. So at that point, he says, I'm gonna go and look for Riley, which would be the bare minimum, wouldn't it? I mean, you would just be out the door straight away. But this is what he tells Chantal, I'm gonna go look for her. But when she comes back, because she's been searching, he was apparently pretending to be asleep on the couch. Also, she didn't think for a moment that he'd tried to look for Riley. And again, how out of context is that action? I know that every single one of you watching this empathizes with the reality that if your child or a child of somebody that you love and that you care for was missing, sleep wouldn't be in your consideration. The idea of sleep at all, when you are dealing with such a high level of frustration, anxiety, fear, you just don't get to do it. And on the day that the child has disappeared, you are gonna be searching everywhere, as long as it takes. You're not gonna be thinking about lying on a couch and going to sleep because your brain will be flooded with images and horrific ideas about what could have happened. And the very fact that he's asleep or even pretending to be asleep means he's not computing the experience. He's not emotionally engaged with it at all. And genuinely, if I had been Chantel, you would have to hope that I didn't have access to some kind of broom handle in that moment because I would give him a rude awakening with it, genuinely. And I'm sure that you all agree that you would do the same. He better be a very fast runner because my kids miss him and you're asleep or weirdly pretending to be asleep, then run or duck because I'm coming for you. It's as simple as that. On May the 10th, 2019, one of the things that happens is that Hayden and his parents, who are very concerned because Hayden's devastated that his girlfriend's disappeared, they actually went to the police with text messages that had come from Riley on the day of her disappearance. Even though Hayden actually deleted his and Riley's text from his mobile phone because basically his parents checked his phone. So he was like, I'm just gonna <laughs> delete all those messages. Obviously his parents were not as tech savvy as me because I would know where to look, even where the deleted messages are. But not everyone is a snoop, like I might be. I'm not admitting I'm a snoop or that I look at my kids' phones. I'm just saying, I know how to. But he realized that maybe in spite of the fact that he's deleted them, they might be able to get access to the deleted text on his Apple Watch and they were there. So essentially, he can now present the police with the messages and there were some really worrying ones. So these included the last message Riley ever sent and she texted Hayden just after 11 p.m. This is when the couple were also on FaceTime and she texted, Andy's in my room, shh, don't say anything about it. He can hear everything, I'm scared. Oh. It makes me go cold, genuinely, it makes me go cold just thinking about that. The fact that he's obviously a malevolent presence. Let's be honest, if you are living in a house and your mother's got a partner, you are going to want to feel safe around that human being. And for the most part, that's what happens. You feel safe. The very fact that he's in her room and she feels fear, that says that she knows his potential. That says that he hasn't been there just once. He's been around her in a way that's made her feel unsafe. So she clearly recognises a predatory element about this man. And also, what is he doing in a teenage girl's bedroom? He isn't his biological father. He isn't related to her in that way. And I appreciate I come from a step family myself. I know that we have strong relationships with stepchildren. I appreciate that. But this is a man who is in a non-biological relationship with this girl who hasn't been in her life for a huge amount of time. And yet he's feeling that it's appropriate to go into her bedroom at night. Deeply concerning. Because you should not be breaching such a boundary with a child particularly when their parent isn't around.
And that says to me that he has something on his mind that is inappropriate about Riley. And it's horrendous to imagine that somebody that she should feel safe with is scaring her. What was he acting like? What was he doing? Was he just silently staring at her? It's awful to imagine that this girl in the safety of her own home felt so unsafe. Now on May the 15th, 2019 at 9 a.m., the sheriff's office led this huge search for Riley. And so many people came. They lent their equipment in the search effort. They had lots of different organizations. So the Red Cross donated food and drink for the people in the search party. And over 300 volunteer community members attended, as well as 50 law enforcement and volunteer officers. So this was a massive search. They wanted to bring Riley home. And by this point, the police had already logged hundreds of man hours in their hunt to find Riley. They were totally on the ball with it. And I think that that's really important because you want to believe when anybody that you love has gone missing, no stone has been left unturned because that leaves you open to the trauma of thinking, what if? When they place so many people into a search and you know that people are absolutely committed and dedicated to bringing your child or the person you love home at least you have that sense of peace that you tried really really hard lance riley's dad he arrived and he said that he genuinely thought riley had been abducted he said there is no way she would run away from home she would never cause this kind of worry Riley's sister Jade, she said that Riley was her best friend and begged whoever has Riley to please bring her home safely. She said, I'm so scared. I'm never going to see my sister again. So the family are just entirely traumatised and they cannot fathom why Riley would have left of her own volition. And so they genuinely believe that it's highly likely she has indeed been abducted. Sadly, Jade never got her wish. And ultimately, the fear that she had about never seeing her sister again came true. Because on May the 16th, 2019, just one week after Riley had gone missing, the extremely decomposed body of a young girl was found in a rubbish bag near Tuscarora Pike. Can you believe that? In a rubbish bag. This unbelievably lovely, incalculably important human being was just tossed away like rubbish. When they found her body, which was in a real bad state of decomposition, they could see that her t-shirt had been pulled up, but it was bunched around her neck area and she also wasn't wearing a bra. Her denim shorts were unzipped and unbuttoned and she was wearing red underwear that was pulled really uncomfortably high in a way that looked like she hadn't basically put them on herself. She only had one of her shoes on and one of the things that they noticed about her body was that on the right shoulder and also on one of her legs she was covered in this white chalky substance. Now, people who knew her were really surprised that she was actually wearing shorts also because he said she was usually the kind of person who just wore really stretchy and comfy clothes. So usually she'd be wearing leggings. And the very fact that it looks like somebody else has dressed her, the fact that she was in a state of being disheveled in her clothes, that says to me sexual motive every day of the week. I know that decomposition makes it very difficult to figure out what's happened to somebody's body before death, but it just follows what we'd expect in a sexual attack. When the autopsy was later carried out, they weren't able to actually specifically establish the cause of death because she was so decomposed. And to put it into context, part of her body was actually skeletonized. So in the end, they ruled that it was homicide due to unspecified means in a setting of decomposition. I'll tell you what I think. I think she will have been strangled to death after being sexually assaulted. That's what I think happened. And arguably the person responsible is lucky to some degree that the body was in such a state of decomposition that it was impossible to say exactly how she had died. But to me, sexual predator attack every day of the week. Andy McCauley is then interviewed again. So this is not long after the discovery of Riley's body. And it's not long after this is charged with first degree murder, the concealment of a body and also death by child abuse. The sheriff said basically Andy had been a suspect since day one in the press conference and it doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure out that we've all been on the same page with that. The trial begins on the 27th of September 2021 with Andy pleading not 
guilty. I genuinely cannot compute why this man would think that going not guilty was a good idea. I mean, bang to rights, just his actions alone tell you that he's an absolute out and out liar. The text where she's from beyond the grave, as the detective involved in the case suggested, said that he was somebody that she was very scared of. And that meant there was a reason behind being scared. Also, the deflection when it comes down to fabricating what he was doing to try to make him seem innocent of doing anything to her because he was involved in drugs elsewhere. And not really caring at all when she went missing, not getting involved in the search for the most part. Everything points to this man knowing there's no point searching because Riley's not coming home because he knows exactly what's happened to Riley. When it came down to the court case, it was big. So they introduced 239 pieces of evidence. And to be fair, one of the detectives said out of all the cases that ever worked on, this was the most evidence that had ever been presented. Over 30 people testified. The prosecution argued that Andy had actually suffocated Riley with a pillow in a bedroom because they found a pillow that had saliva and blood on it. So when they tested that, that was confirmed to be Riley's. So she could well have been suffocated. Like I said, for me personally, I think about this kind of predator and I think about somebody who's sexually molested and I genuinely think choking them would probably be how they actually took the life. Genuinely, I know that I'm not there and I'm certainly not a medical expert, but personally, I just feel like that would be the method of this kind of sexual predator. The evidence against Andy, well, there was a lot. So bear in mind, this guy's saying he's not guilty and then they're bringing in these pieces of evidence. For example, the fact that roofing screws were found in his vehicle that were used for his work and they were found near Riley's body. Parts of her body were coated in that substance and it was dry wall mud, which was also found in the back of Andy's truck. A cadaver dog had alerted to the positive presence of a deceased person's odor in Andy's truck and his truck was seen outside the home on the morning Riley went missing, then was seen on CCTV near the location where her body was discovered. But obviously he's not guilty. So yeah, he doesn't sound guilty at all, does he? I mean, I'd go not guilty. It seems obvious. I mean, sorry, I'm not guilty. Are you not guilty? No, I'm not guilty. I'm, you'll be able to see I'm not guilty. How will I be able to see you're not guilty? Well, you're not going to be able to find anything that indicates that I was anywhere near the victim. Yes, we've got CCTV of you literally in the area where the victim's body was dumped. Also, we've got powder all over the body that seems to have come from your car boot. Also, there's a dog that indicated the presence of a corpse was in your car. Also, just throwing it out there, we have a witness who said you were parked outside the house when she disappeared. Also, we literally have all the evidence indicating that you are not only a massive liar, you're also a murderer. No, I'm not guilty. I'm not, I'm, I am. I'm saying that there's a completely reasonable explanation why all that was there. And it's because I was buying drugs. Just, just drugs. There was drugs. That's all. Not guilty. Do we have an opportunity to return to medieval times? Is it possible? I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not saying everyone's going to be for it. I get it. People will be like, oh, come on, Emma. Bad things happen when innocent people end up being tortured and killed because it was once considered an appropriate method to deal with offenders. I get it. I'm just saying when you know that they absolutely did, is that something that we could consider just trialing, just trialing, not saying we permanently legislate. I'm just maybe just trialing it. Just the old thumb screw. Those mummy things that had all the spikes in when they closed it on you. No, I know we live in civilized times. We live in civilized times. But I just feel like Riley didn't get a lot of civility in this case. And the very fact that this man wants to put her family through the trauma of a court case because essentially he wants to get away with it. Can we just be real about this? That's what really gets my goat. When we are talking about a child's life being ended without doubt in a horrifying fashion by somebody that she was meant to be able to trust, she was given no civility whatsoever. And 
this man shows no remorse whatsoever. When you go not guilty, it means I don't care. All I care about is getting away with it. I do not have empathy or sympathy with somebody who takes responsibility either. If you murder somebody, you're bound to rights, you're going down and you should. But if you have the good grace to say, I did it. If you can bring some level of closure to the family and explain what happened. If you can fill in the missing pieces of the puzzle to offer them at least an understanding of what played out. If you can say sorry. It doesn't mean you are not responsible for the horror, but you prevent them from having to go through the court case and having to listen to all of the evidence, having to hear what the prosecution suggests happened to their loved one. And then you at least give them that sense that even though you did this horrible thing, you recognise it was wrong. That's why saying you're guilty when you're guilty is so powerfully important. Because even though it doesn't bring that person back, it lessens the agony and endurance the family have to face during a trial. And also it means that they feel that you've accepted you are culpable. You go not guilty, you're saying, I don't care about what I did. I care only about my freedom. And I will psychologically ravage that family. I will do everything in my power to put them through pain to save my own skin. So I know that the thumb screws are never going to come back. But I'm just saying there are moments when I cover cases like this where I genuinely think it would be worthwhile. The very fact that they have all this evidence is powerful, of course. A witness had also seen Andy take some contracts and rubbish bags and three of those were found with Riley's body. Johnny Walter, so one of Andy's co-workers, they said that on the day of Riley's disappearance, he and Andy had actually done a line of cocaine. They'd then gone to work at the Red Hill subdivision. Then Andy had basically left at 9am and he hadn't come back to work until around 2 to 2.30pm. Now, this witness account obviously differs from the statement that Andy had initially given to the police when he was questioned. And then we know that Andy had changed his story multiple times. So the prosecution do not have a hard job at making it clear that you're dealing with a pathological liar. And it doesn't take too much to start helping the jury understand that you're dealing with somebody with such an antisocial personality that he could well have done what he's accused of doing. Now, crucially, the text that Riley had actually sent to Hayden saying that she was scared and that Andy was in the room, they were presented to the jury. And as I said earlier, Prosecutor Dan James said that this was Riley speaking from beyond the grave. When it came down to the jury having to deliberate, it didn't take them long. And this was actually put out on court TV. So the trail was broadcast. And on one level, I think that that's helpful because you can just see that Andy is guilty as hell. He shows no emotion. He actually has really poor emotional cues full stop. So there is nothing on his face that gives you an indication that he's feeling. He's just stoic. And in the context of what we're talking about, that is not to be expected unless there is something emotionally deficient within you. There is something emotionally deficient within this man, without a doubt, but it's also grueling for the family. Imagine having your daughter's trial put out there to the masses. Imagine what that does as regards people's opinions. We all know what it's like on social media. And I, for one, would never search myself on social media because you're not going to find anything positive. You're going to find lots of people saying negative things about you. And that's OK. People are allowed their opinions, right? But a lot of people can't help themselves, particularly when they're dealing with something so emotive at this kind of trial. And they go on and they say how they feel. And sometimes they might be saying about you as a human being in the family. And they might be saying that they think that you're also guilty within the family. For example, Chantelle was the mother in this case, she brought him into the home. So there'll be a lot of people, because it's on court TV, giving their opinion, and those opinions may not be very positive. And if you're searching them, which very often people do, it's adding to the weight that you will feel and the burden that you will feel because you are seeing that people think negatively about you. And the judge actually commented that they felt that the family probably did feel a sense of burden with the cameras being in the court. That said, like I note, it was very easy to see that Andy was guilty as hell. And indeed, the jury do find him guilty on all charges. And 
wow. The prosecution attorney was so powerful when he spoke to the court. He basically asked for no mercy and he was tearing up. It felt like he really connected, not just with Riley, but with the family. And he just said, you know, this guy does not need parole ever. We should never give him the opportunity, essentially, to walk the streets. Judge Deborah McLaughlin, who was presiding over the proceedings, said, it defies logic why anyone would kill an innocent 15-year-old girl. Now, as for the motive, it's uncertain. He didn't admit why he'd done it. He didn't say he actually had done it. He certainly didn't explain what had taken place. He didn't even testify in court. That's another thing I don't get. Honestly, I'm gonna say this time and time again. I appreciate that there is a rule where you can just choose not to say anything, but I just don't think it's fair. I think you should be forced because you have the story. If you're innocent, you shouldn't have to worry, just speak freely. And if you're guilty, well, you should still have to answer questions that are put to you. But clearly the defense felt that it wouldn't be good to have him up there because he has the emotional vocabulary of a rock. And actually, probably less than a rock. Some rocks are kind of smooth and cute and you can carry them around in your pocket and use them as a psychological anchor when you're having a bad day. He wouldn't even be that useful. He's just like the emotional vocabulary of a blob, just a blob, a blob of something. That's what Andy is, just a blob of emotionless nothing. But he was allowed not to testify in court. But Chantel, Riley's mum, she absolutely, like me, believes there was a sexual motive. I would imagine every single one of you watching this thinks there was a sexual motive. Firstly, it's likely she was killed in the bedroom. Secondly, she was dressed in clothes she wouldn't ordinarily wear. Third, even her clothes were inappropriately put on. The fact that she was dressed in red underwear, all of these things speak to me of a sexual predator violating Riley before her death and probably after her death as well. And the reason that Chantel also felt that he was lightly responsible on a sexual level is he was quite a sexually aggressive person when he'd used drugs. I just think that that's an excuse, honestly, not from Chantel, I'm saying from Andy. I think people have a sexually aggressive tendency, it's their predilection, drugs just gives them the confidence to act out. So it's within them, they just don't necessarily feel it's appropriate for the most part in intimate relationships to be aggressive unless it's mutually consented to. So for him, once he's sniffed some coke, he can then truly allow himself to drop those inhibitions and be sexually aggressive at will and pleasure. And the likelihood is, He'd taken drugs and he decided that he wanted to attack Riley. She's an attractive 15 year old girl and he clearly felt motivated in a way towards her on a sexual level. And because she would, without a doubt, probably fought back, probably said that she was gonna tell her mum, that's what sealed her fate. He knew that he couldn't get away with it after he'd done it, so he killed her. In a victim impact statement, Chantelle described her daughter as, the most amazing person anyone could know. And she said that she hopes that Andy never sees the light of day. She said that he had thrown her daughter away like a piece of trash. She also noted how he had watched her in agony for nine days whilst the search for Riley was carried out, but still he remained silent. In November, 2021, the court did show him no mercy. The jury found Andy guilty on all charges. Of course they did. They were always gonna find him guilty because he was clearly guilty as hell. It's just mind blowing and mind boggling that he sat there totally motionless, looking guilty, seeming guilty, and all of his actions leading up until the trial were guilty. Of course he was gonna be found guilty, but you just have to be kind of blown away at the fact that Andy, had this idea that people would believe that he was innocent, that there was any doubt whatsoever that he killed her. And I guess that he was just thinking to himself, well, they haven't actually got evidence to say how she was murdered. So how can they prove that I was the person who murdered her, even though there was a plethora 
of evidence. Like I said, over 200 pieces brought into court because it was such a strong case. So he was found guilty of murder and was also convicted of concealment of a body and death of a child by a custodian by child abuse. Judge Deborah McLaughlin said that it defies logic why anyone would kill an innocent 15 year old girl. Now, as I've noted, it's uncertain as far as they're concerned what Andy's motive was because he didn't admit to the crime. He didn't explain how it happened. He didn't even testify in court. But Chantel, Riley's mum, she, like I, believes that there was absolutely a sexual motive. It goes without saying there was a sexual motive. Also, just think about what she was wearing when they found the body. He dressed her in red underwear. That in itself tells me that he probably abused her before he killed her and then abused her after he killed her. Also, Chantal said he was somebody who was very sexually aggressive once he took drugs. And I don't think he's sexually aggressive because he's taking drugs. He's sexually aggressive because that's his nature. The cocaine would just give him a bit of a kick inhibition-wise and he'd think, right, I can act this way. I've got more confidence to act this way. And I do appreciate that some people have a particular interest in things like BDSM and when it's consenting adults, that's perfectly acceptable. But we're talking about a man who clearly was sexually aggressive to Chantel when she wasn't necessarily somebody who invited that. And likewise, as a sexual predator with access to a child and you've taken drugs and you're in a position where you're alone with that kid, the chances are if you've got that nature, you're going to see that as an absolute opportunity. So I would imagine that he basically violated Riley. She was probably saying that she was going to tell her mum or that she was going to tell somebody about this and he reacted by smothering her or strangling her, as I said, because again, that's very much in line with that kind of sexual attack. Without a doubt, he murdered her because he violated her in a sexual manner. In a victim impact statement, Chantelle described her daughter as just the most amazing person anyone could know. She said that she couldn't believe that he had thrown her away like a piece of trash. And she also talked about the fact that he had witnessed her in absolute agony for nine days. He just stood by whilst that search for Riley went on and he just remained silent. She said, he left her there for nine days as we agonized, watching our misery, our torment. He's the only one who can tell us what happened to our daughter. Because of what he did, we won't see her graduate. We won't see her marry. We won't see her have a family of her own. We didn't even get to give her a kiss on the forehead or say goodbye. And that's so true because her body was in such a state of decomposition. They didn't get to hold her one last time. That was denied them too. And that's a further blow in cases like this because ultimately as a mother, as a father, all you wanna be able to do is to hold your baby. And her body was just in such a terrible state that, as I said, part of it was skeletonized. Her father, he was devastated, of course. He said that Riley will be frozen in time. And he said he did not want that man, that predator, to be shown mercy. He didn't want him to ever have the chance of parole. It was such an emotional, emotional talk. And he said that he'd shown no mercy to Riley and therefore no mercy should be shown because obviously the defense was saying, okay, give him 15 years and then offer an opportunity for parole. They were saying, you know, he might not get the opportunity for parole, but you know, it should be on the table. And you sit there and you're like, no, it shouldn't be on the table. This man knowingly and willingly murdered a child, then tried to conceal that he was involved, then said he wasn't guilty and put the whole family through a case. This man is not accountable or responsible. This man is never going to be safe because you're only ever someone who can be rehabilitated when you accept your guilt. Her father said, why should he even get a look in at 15 years when my daughter was only allowed 15 years of life because of his actions? It was so powerful. Now, as I've said, as this was a really public trial because it was on court TV, one of the things that happened was that Morgan County Prosecutor Dan James actually spoke about the rumours that were running through the community. And the reason for this is because people were saying that they didn't believe that Andy had acted alone. They actually felt that potentially the victim's mother was involved. So they were talking about Chantel being a part of it. 
And this prosecutor said there's absolutely no evidence that anyone else was involved in this crime. There's no evidence that Chantal was involved. And he said that the speculation from strangers and from the community members was basically causing trauma to the victim's siblings. He said that Riley's mother will have to live with this for the rest of her life, that she had let Andy into her home, but there was absolutely no evidence that anyone other than Andy McCauley did this crime. And that is something that unfortunately visibility is gonna bring. It's what we talk about here. We're interested, we're intrigued by these cases, we're curious. And sometimes we have ideas that others might not have when it comes to the case itself. And that leads to us connecting with other people who share similar views as well. And we understand that at times that can cause pain because we can get it wrong. But it's undeniable that people are always gonna be interested in cases where a man was brought into a home and essentially snuffed out the life of one of the children within that home, particularly in such a sinister and without doubt sexual way. And sometimes people feel that another party must be privy to it because it literally happened at the home address. But in this case, it's 100% clear that Chantelle had absolutely nothing to do with it. He also talked about the fact that there were rumours online that Chantelle was contacting Andy in jail and that that was 100% not true. She hadn't been to the jail, she hadn't spoken to him at all, because why would she wish to? She knows he took her child. She knows that her daughter's last moments would have been spent in terror at the hands of a man that she brought into her home. The prosecutor also didn't hold back in describing the kind of character that Andy was. He said that he shows no remorse at all and that all Andy was concerned about was his next fix. He also told the court that a warrant had been issued for McCauley's mother related to the fact that she was apparently attempting to distribute drugs to him whilst he was incarcerated. What a lovely family. What a fa If I'm not thinking about taking drugs for my son, who's on a murder charge in prison. I don't know what I'm doing with my parenting skills. At the end of the day, if my child just needs a fix of heroin or crack cocaine or anything he fancies, I'm just not a good parent unless I attend the need immediately. Seriously, the kind of mother does that? Actually, the kind of mother that creates somebody like Andy McCauley with respect. So, Arguably, it feels like in this family, criminality is clearly running through their veins. End of. So at the end of the day, at least we know that Andy's never ever going to get parole. At least we're in a scenario where he's serving two life sentences. And whilst that absolutely fails in any way, shape or form to make up for the horrific death, that's played out in this case, at least she, to some degree, as in Riley, has power over this predator now. And what we know in prison is that people who kill children really don't have the best time. And I hope that every day, someone in prison reminds him through incidents, through harsh words, through threats, that he is the reprehensible human being that we all know him to be. Riley was a beautiful, loved young girl with a life full of potential and that potential has been stolen because of this man's selfish, deviant needs. And even though they don't exactly know what happened, I think we can all put together exactly what played out the night that she was murdered. She was in a situation where a predator entered her room, sexually violated her, killed her, and then probably violated her again, dressing her body and then discarding it like rubbish. Because that's the thing about people like Andy. They're individuals who are so egocentric, who have so little emotional connection with anything other than their own needs, that murdering a defenseless child for sexual pleasure is something that's worthwhile. Because in that moment, all they're thinking about is their needs. All they're thinking about is what they want. I hope to God that every single day that he's in prison, he's reminded by other prisoners just how low child killers are considered while serving very long sentences. I hope there's an incident, I hope there's a moment in every single day where he's terrified, where he realises that for the rest of his life he's going to endure that kind of terror. Because hopefully that will give him just a flicker of the horror that gorgeous girl experienced when he snuffed her life out. 
repent at leisure, Andy. And even though he probably won't repent at all, I'm sure when he takes his last breath, he'll be taking that fiery elevator all the way down to the center of hell, where for the rest of eternity, he can burn very brightly. Take care, guys. See you again next time.